Good uh, Namidag um, and welcome to this uh, webinar on the uh, Schrems 2 decision. Um, my name is Bastian Brennungs. I'm a partner at the uh, Belgian independent law firm Lydian. And the aim or the purpose of this uh, short webinar is in fact to give you a bit of, uh, first of all, the background to the uh, Schrems 2 decision. Um, what the decision is exactly about, what are the learnings of the decision, um, and what is the impact for you as uh, data controllers and as data processors. Maybe before we start off, um, a couple of more administrative things, um, three items in fact. First of all, the slides, uh, you may be interested in getting a uh, copy uh, of the slides and you find the slides at your right hand side or at the right hand side of the screen under handouts and there you can download uh, the slides in PDF format for later uh, use. Secondly, um, as with all the seminars or the, the webinars that we organize, um, you will receive from the system about one hour after the uh, webinar or after the end of the webinar uh, a certificate of attendance so you will uh, receive that automatically and then third important um, issue is questions should there be any questions and I guess there may be a lot of questions given the topic that we are talking about SHRAMS 2 um, if you have any questions that you would like to raise during this webinar please feel free to use the uh, chat function um, again, at the right hand side of your screen where you can uh, ask your questions and uh, I will try uh, to respond to them uh, during the webinar or if that's not possible, I will come back to you individually and answer them uh, thereafter to the extent possible. Now let us start with uh, the topic of today, Schrems 2, uh, a major decision and I would like to say in fact that um, in privacy, in data protection, I would say there is never a dull day. There's always something happening. There are all, always some decisions, uh, either by the Court of Justice of the European Union or some important uh, decisions or recommendations by the European Data Protection Board, by the European Data Protection Su uh, Supervisor, or by any of the 27 or 28 supervisory authorities and this is um, exactly what happened um, with the uh, Schrems uh, decision. What would, uh, will I talk uh, about today? First of all, and let's move to the next slide, first of all a short introduction into international data transfers. Of course I will not explain to you the entire mechanism of international data transfers but I think it's important to remind you of just the basic rules. Uh, it, it's the background against which this Schrems 2 decision has been, um, uh, has been rendered. Secondly, I will shortly give you the background on Schrems 1 because we are talking here about the Schrems 2 decision. So there was a Schrems 1 decision. What was it about and how does it compare with the current decision Schrems 2? Then, of course, uh, I will go into the detail of what the impact exactly is of Schrems 2. Uh, I will talk about the impact of Schrems 2 on the supervisory authorities, the impact on uh, controllers and processors, and so on. And then, last but not least, uh, to do's for you as either a controller or a processors processor, uh, what are your to-dos uh, after this Schrems 2 decision? But let us first start with uh, the very basics of international data transfers under the GDPR and in fact this is not very different from the principles that we knew from the Directive 9546. Um, Basically, the GDPR says that you cannot transfer personal data outside the European economic area. That's the basic principle. And then, to put it very simple, you have three exceptions. You have three possibilities to still transfer data outside of the European economic area. The first possibility is 
you transfer data to a country which benefits from a so-called adequacy decision. Uh, that means that the European Commission has um, verified the laws on privacy, on data protection of this country, and has come to the conclusion that this country offers uh, adequate protection for personal data being sent to that country. And for the time being, there are 12 countries that have been um, recognized as offering adequate protection, amongst others Switzerland, Japan, um, and there was, and it's, this is one of the topics of SHREPS 2, there was a 13th decision, and the 13th decision was about um, the privacy shield. And the US itself was not as such recognized by the European Commission as offering adequate protection, but uh, the system that had been set up uh, where companies, US companies, could voluntarily um, adhere to the so-called privacy shield, and that system was recognized by the European Commission as offering adequate protection. This is the first possibility. Second possibility is uh, there is no decision from the European Commission and for, for the country to which you want to um, export data. In that case, you can put in place appropriate safeguards. And there, the appropriate safeguards, <clears throat> they may take different forms. Uh, it can be in the form of binding corporate rules. We know them, them from before the GDPR also, but now with the GDPR, they have been um, properly regulated um, in, in the GDPR. You have the so-called standard contractual clauses. These are the sets of, there are three for the time being, three sets of standard contractual clauses. That means model clauses that have been adopted by the European Commission. They have, in fact, been adopted under Directive 9546, but the European Data Protection Board and the European uh, legislator have always said that they remained uh, valid also <coughs> after the entry into force of the GDPR. And these are the so-called standard contractual clauses, which you put in place between the exporter and the data importer. You have the system of ad hoc clauses, but those must be approved by the European Data Protection Board. You have the new system of codes of conduct. There are no examples today, but this is a possibility in the future. Uh, codes of conduct combined with binding and enforceable commitments from the controller or the processor uh, in the third country to apply these appropriate safeguards. And then you have a similar um, item which is certification mechanisms um, so the company to which you want to export or the organization to which you want to export data um, has been certified and there are binding and enforceable commitments uh, on the parties in that third country to apply those appropriate safeguards this is the second possible mechanism and then the third mechanism is in fact the so-called derogations there are a limited number of derogations and in those cases you can transfer personal data outside of the EEA even without there being an adequacy decision or appropriate safeguards uh, those derogations and that we know from um, the guidance that has been given have to be uh, applied very strictly and for example one of the possibilities is explicit consent, but again, explicit consent cannot be relied upon for uh, reg regular uh, transfers to outside the EEA. This is the background against which the Schrems 1 decision was rendered. Schrems 1 decision, what was it about? Well, Max Schrems, for those who don't know him, uh, an Austrian privacy activist, in fact, at the moment, that he started the proceedings um, that led to the Schrems 1 decision, he was still a, uh, a student. Um, and the first proceedings, Schrems 1, started with a complaint before the Irish Data Protection Commissioner in 2013, where Max Schrems said, um, I do not want my personal data to be transferred by Facebook on the basis of the safe harbor decision because and he referred there to the Snowden revelations. 
because in the US, in fact, there is indiscriminate um, mouse surveillance, which means that, in fact, that safe harbor is not worth so much, and my data are not adequately protected in the United States of America. Uh, in first instance, the DPC dismissed the claim. Uh, there was an appeal before the Irish High Court, and the Irish High Court then referred the matter to the um, Court of Justice of the European Union. And that led to the first victory of Mr. Schrems. Uh, and that first victory consisted basically in the fact that the safe harbor mechanism that existed then, 2015, that, that safe harbor decision was declared invalid because the, co the court found that um, it did not offer adequate protection of personal data uh, and certainly not at an equivalent level as that uh, that we know within the European Union. So this was the first decision. What was the result? You will probably know it. The result was that during more than a year um, there was no adequacy decision for the US, at least this, this uh, um, safe harbor decision had been invalidated and so other safeguards needed to be put in place for transfers to the US. 2016, uh, in February 2016, there had been um, the privacy shield or the draft privacy shield has been uh, issued by the European Commission. And finally, on the 12th of July 2016, the privacy shield was uh, adopted by the European Commission. And there was again a mechanism to transfer personal data uh, from the European Union to the United States. This was the so-called new adequacy uh, mechanism. And since then, a lot of companies, US companies, have adhered to this new EU-US privacy shield. And you will find them back um, on the website of the US uh, government on uh, privacy shield. Now, Schrems 2 is no longer or was no longer about the um, safe harbor because it has had been invalidated. It was in fact about the standard contractual clauses. Uh, it is in fact a sequel to the Schrems 1 decision because um, in the proceedings before the Data Protection Commissioner in uh, Ireland, uh, it was said by Facebook that um, a lot of the transfers that it was doing were not on the basis of privacy shield or safe harbor uh, in the past, but they were based on uh, standard contractual clauses. And so Mr. Schrems decided again to uh, reformulate its, uh, his complaint and said, well, even those transfers on the basis of standard contractual clauses, they are not valid because I believe that even the standard contractual clauses do not provide for adequate protection when data are being transferred to the United States of America. Um, the Irish DPC this time referred the matter very quickly to the High Court because it found that questions again, prejudicial questions again, had to be posed or be asked uh, to the CGEU, and the CGEU uh, received about 11 prejudicial questions on EU-US data transfers. The main purpose of, this, uh, of those questions were about challenging the validity of the so-called standard contractual clauses. Yeah. Those standard contractual clauses, I explained it already, they, they warrant compliance with the GDPR's requirement. Um, they were adopted under the 9546 um, uh, directive, but they remained valid afterwards and they are also widely used. I think that almost all companies or organizations that today are transferring personal data to non-EEA countries which have not been um, recognized as providing adequate protection, um, that they are using those standard contractual tools. So the impact of this Schrems 2 decision is really huge for companies in day-to-day -day, um, reality. 
What does the decision say? Well, the decision on Schrems 2 goes back to Article 46.1 of the GDPR, which and reiterates, reiterates three important elements. It says, look, according to Article 46.1 of the GDPR, transfers of personal data outside of the EU, they require three things. First of all, there must be appropriate safeguards put in place. That's the first issue, first criterion. Second criterion is not only must there be appropriate safeguards, there must also be enforceable rights by data subjects. That means that data subjects have effective rights and third, they can effectively use those rights and obtain effective legal, legal remedies uh, from courts, tribunals, and so on. Those are the three elements that the um, Court of Justice of the European Union always comes back on. Appropriate safeguards, enforceable rights by data subjects, and effective legal remedies by data subjects. Now, what is the decision now about? First of all, and very surprisingly, yeah, because everyone was waiting for a decision on the standard contractual clauses, nobody was expecting, or at least very few people were expecting, really a, a groundbreaking decision on the privacy shield. Well, the first thing that the Court of Justice of the European Union does is it deals with the privacy shield and it says, well, we consider that the privacy shield in its actual form is invalid. And it refers to, amongst others, um, the statement that the Commission shall, in particular, take account of the following elements. The rule of law, so what is the legal system in the country, including concerning public security, defense, national security and criminal law, and access, access of public authorities to personal data as well as enforceable data subject rights. So again, this item of enforceable rights for data subjects and effective administrative and judicial redress for the data subjects. It, the, the, the court um, examines the legal system in the US and it says, well, the US surveillance and those laws mandating U.S. surveillance, they are not limited in any way by proportionality, and the power that they confirm is very wide. On the basis of those surveillance laws, it's possible to almost unlimited put in place surveillance programs. And so the conclusion is that, um, according to the Court of Justice, the privacy shield, in fact, fails to protect the people's rights to privacy, data protection, and especially access to remedy, because this is one of the elements that is really um, accentuated by the court. It says, look, there is this system with the ombudsman. Uh, in fact, this is not an effective legal remedy. In fact, data subjects um, in the US whose data have been transferred from within Europe to the US, they do not really have effective and enforceable legal remedies. And so it comes to the conclusion that uh, the privacy shield is invalid. That's a very, uh, very first um, um, conclusion. And it's very clear uh, companies will in the future no longer be able to rely on the privacy shield. Secondly, the court deals with the so-called standard contractual clauses, and there all eyes were uh, directed towards the court because everyone was looking at what the court would decide. Would it say that the standard contractual clauses are valid or invalid? And maybe a bit surprisingly, it says, well, the standard contractual clauses, they are valid. But it, it doesn't stop there. The court clearly says that 
the standard contractual clauses may be a valid mechanism to transfer data from within the European Union to outside the European economic area to countries not offering adequate protection. But it says one has to do a um, case by case analysis and look whether actually effectively those standard contractual clauses that are being put in place will be able to provide an adequate level of protection to personal data and it refers to a footnote uh, to clause five of the standard contractual clauses and says that uh, mandatory requirements of that legislation which do not go beyond what is necessary in a democratic society to safeguard inter alia national security, defense, and public secure, security are not in contradiction with those standard data protection clauses, but, but compliance with an obligation prescribed by the law of the third country of destination, which goes beyond what is necessary for those purposes, must be treated as a breach of those clauses. And so basically the court says, yes, the standard contractual clauses may be used to transfer data um, outside the European Union, but controllers and also supervisory authorities must check, and I will come back on that later, must check in each and every case whether effectively those standard contractual clauses will provide the um, the protection that is expected uh, of them and in some cases yeah, and that's the, the the other side of course they are valid but in some cases one may need to conclude that even with the standard contractual clauses um, adequate protection of personal data is not guaranteed and in that case and the court is very very specific on that in that case uh, a data exporter that was already exporting data on the basis of those standard contractual clauses has an obligation to suspend those transfers of personal data and also a supervisory authority that investigates the matter and would come to the conclusion that even when there are those standard contractual clauses in place those standard contractual clauses in that particular case do not offer the protection uh, that is necessary or to a level that is equivalent uh, to the GDPR, uh, again, the supervisory authority in that case has the obligation to either suspend or prohibit these uh, transfers based on those standard contractual clauses. So basically, um, what is the impact of the Schrems decision? Well, First of all, it's clear that this is a second victory for, for Mr. Schrems. But in practice, what does it mean? First of all, it means clearly that organizations can no longer rely on the privacy shield for transfers to the US. Um, the importance of this decision cannot be underestimated because uh, although a lot of companies are uh, transferring data on the basis of a mix between standard contractual clauses and uh, the privacy shield, you will know <clears throat> that a lot of con uh, US companies are relying solely on the privacy shield for transfers. And so all of these companies will need to um, look for other mechanisms to legitimize their um, out of the EU data transfers. That's the first um, important conclusion. <clears throat> Second important conclusion about the standard contractual clauses. Well, about the standard contractual clauses, two things to be mentioned. First of all, putting in place the standard contractual clauses is, if I read the decision correctly, is no longer a guarantee that you are okay or that you're all right under GDPR with international data transfer rules. You will probably know as, um, as a privacy uh, practitioner that before Schrems 2, 
putting in place standard construction clauses was a bit like um, signing a form. Uh, companies entered into outsourcing, outsourcing agreements or other types of agreements, and it was just a matter of adding these standard contractual clauses as a schedule to this outsourcing agreement, filling in the blanks at the end, uh, schedule two or, or annex one and, and annex two of the standard contractual clauses. So it was a kind of a box ticking exercise. <clears throat> This changes entirely with SRAMS 2. Standard contractual clauses in and of itself may not be sufficient. You will need to ascertain as a, um, as a data controller and as a data processor, when exporting data, you will need to ascertain whether <coughs> those standard contractual clauses will indeed offer the necessary protection in the third country. Uh, I will come back to that on what exactly you will have to do uh, later. If you find that the standard contractual clauses do not offer the protection that is required, you will need to suspend the further uh, export of data. The scope of this decision is also um, important to underline. First of all, the decision does not only concern the US. Yeah. The attention has gone to the US because this is a um, the entire Schrems 2 case talks about Facebook exporting data to the US under standard contractual clauses. But of course, what the court says on standard contractual clauses is not only valid for transfers to the US, but is also valid for uh, transfers to any other third country um, and especially countries such as. India, Russia, China, and so on, where there are important surveillance uh, laws and uh, surveillance powers. Also important to note is that, uh, and that may be a, a good point, is that <clears throat> a lot of the decision is based um, referring to the US surveillance laws, and those US surveillance laws most of them apply to electronic communication service providers, so cloud storage, telecom, and so on. Companies that are not in that area of business and that do not make use of those kind of services may be less at risk when using standard contractual clauses. And I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Third important element about the scope of the decision is that it concerns both controller to processor and controller to controller standard contractual clauses. Now, what does this mean for the SA? And SA stands for supervisory authorities. Um, a couple of things. First of all, supervisory authorities no different from the data exporters that are willing to export data outside the EEA, they will need to make a difficult assessment of foreign laws. And now we come back to that a bit later, but they will need to assess whether the standard co contractual clauses that have been put in place in a particular uh, case, whether they indeed offer the protection taking into account a number of factors, amongst which the legislation that is applicable to the data importer outside of the European economic area. That's the first um, thing, and the court is very clear on that. I already mentioned it. When the supervisory authority finds that the standard contractual clauses do not offer sufficient protection, it must either uh, prohibit or suspend further transfers of data. Second, <clears throat> for the supervisory authorities, the question raises whether there will be any grace period. Uh, we have had the period under Schrems 1 uh, without any um, safe harbor uh, mechanism and awaiting the privacy shield mechanism. We know that at the time, um, the data protection authorities or the supervisory authorities have granted a kind of um, lenience 
uh, to companies, to organizations saying, well, awaiting this, we will not uh, start um, enforcement action. Uh, this is a first question basically for the, the supervisory authorities. Will or will some of them grant formal grace periods and allow companies and organizations to um, adopt other mechanisms um, legitimizing the international transfer? Or will they do, as for example, the um, Berlin Data Protection Authority, which has already said, I think, the day after the Schrems II decision, that uh, companies should recall uh, their data from the US and put them in uh, European uh, or EU data centers. So that's a second issue. A third issue, and it's again a question, uh, will the supervisory authorities um, draw blacklists? Because one could imagine that uh, the supervisory authorities or the European Data Protection Board, for example, looks and examines the legislation in different countries and could come to the conclusion that, for example, for some countries, and the US is an example, but China may also be an example, and that for some of these countries, standard contractual clauses will never work. That could be well uh, one of the conclusions that because of the um, because of the legal system in those third countries and because of the, for example, mass surveillance or indiscriminate surveillance, that one must come to the conclusion that even if you put in place a contract, yeah, standard contractual clauses, that in any event, authorities will have indiscriminate access to those data and that as a result, even standard contractual clauses will not solve the issue. Yeah. Blacklisting is a possibility, it's a question, I've marked it here as a question, is of course, and it would of course be a very politically sensitive issue if the European Union would start blacklisting countries, uh, especially in the background of uh, international trade and uh, international political relationships. What about the consequences or the impact for the European Commission? Um, as you may know, the European Commission has or was already working on new standard contractual clauses. Why? Because the, some of the standard contractual clauses already uh, date from about 20 years ago. They have never been adapted to the GDPR. They still make reference to the 9546 directive. And notwithstanding, it has been said that they could further be used. But in fact, it's a bit strange to be signing contracts today referring to the 9546 directive, while we are already two years working with the GDPR and with a whole new set of rules uh, under the GDPR. So the European Commission is certainly um, working on those standard contractual clauses. The question that uh, raises is, of course, whether it will not need to take into account Schrems II when amending those standard contractual clauses. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, as I've said, there is need today for a so-called transfer impact assessment. When you want to use standard contractual clauses, well, one could imagine that the standard contractual clauses will incorporate this requirement in the future and will say that, for example, the data exporter, before signing these standard contractual clauses, has carried out a so-called transfer impact assessment and has come to the conclusion and has obtained sufficient um, uh, information to uh, come to the conclusion that the standard contractual clauses will offer sufficient uh, guarantees and sufficient protection for the data uh, protection rights of data subjects. That's one item. The upside is, of course, that um, the European Commission is working on new standard contractual clauses. They may be prompted to do this a little bit faster, given the decision of the um, European Court of Justice. But one of the things that everyone in the data protection world is looking for is processor to processor standard contractual 
you're certainly aware of the issue of subcontracting and what about sub subcontracting who has to sign the so-called standard contractual clauses um, one solution would be to adopt a set of process to process or standard contractual clauses and that would be very welcomed by the privacy or by the community of privacy professionals last important item to consider or impact let me say for the european commission is what about the uk after brexit as you know we are now for brexit in a transition period this transition period will soon end and the idea has always been that um, given the rules that have been adopted by the uk and the fact that it nevertheless implemented or adopted the gdpr that um, and 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 whole set of uh, well, the, the new data protection act uh, the expectation has always been that uh, after the transition period european union would for example issue an adequacy decision saying that the uk is an adequate country um, one should not jump too quickly to conclusions and say well uk is the same as us there is also mass surveillance so the UK will never be able to be um, recognized as an adequate country. Um, I think this would be uh, a too quick decision. There are notable differences between UK legislation on the one hand and US um, surveillance legislation on the other hand. But nevertheless, it is clear that the European Commission will not as such uh, grant adequacy to the UK, it will need to go in a lot of detail before deciding that, and it will have to have, I think, a very strong case that it can defend, for example, before the European, um, well, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union, before it really grants uh, adequacy. So I'm not saying that um, adequacy decision for the UK is no longer possible after Brexit, I'm just saying that it will be much more difficult and that the European Commission will be much more cautious before granting adequacy to the UK. And of course, as this transition period is soon coming to an end, I think this impacts um, a lot of the country of the companies that are um, operating in Belgium and that have links and transfers of data to the UK today. If we look at the impact of Schrems 2 um, on the supervisory authorities and the other authorities, um, one can find uh, different lists that have already been published of the different reactions. The EPDP, um, European Data Protection Board, has said that it is ready to build a new framework that fully complies with data protection law and that is ready to work on that together with the European Commission. Um, it has confirmed also, European Data Protection Board, that uh, putting in place standard contractual clauses um, require an assessment by the data exporter and the data importer, and that if they conclude that the level of protection is not sufficient, uh, they will need to put in place additional measures. Personally, I don't think that this is the end of the issue, putting in place additional uh, measures, because in some cases, you can just not remedy a non-compliance with adequate protection by putting in place more measures between the exporter and the importer. If you think about uh, surveillance and surveillance law, this is not something that you can set aside in a contract between two parties. This is applicable to the data importer in the US, in the UK, in China and so on and the data importer will need to comply with it and you will not be able to do anything about this by putting in place what the EPDP says or calls additional measures. EDPS has also reacted, says that um, well, privacy is a fundamental right that is widely recognized around the globe. For the rest, it doesn't say a lot. It is still examining the... Um, uh, the decision. 
the Autorität der Schutzregierung in the Netherlands has reacted that uh, a new regime for transfers to the US is needed. As I said uh, a moment ago, Berlin has said, or the Berlin Data Protection Authority has said, well, companies and organizations that have currently data on in the US on the basis of standard contractual clauses, they need to recall those data to uh, Europe. This is, I think, one of the, the most harsh uh, points of view of all um, data protection authorities so far. Um, France has applauded the fact that the standard contractual clauses um, remain valid, but it also says that the CNIL is further doing work on examining the decision and will come back on it later. Unfortunately, the Belgian Data Protection Authority has not yet reacted officially, um, and so we're a bit waiting on what will happen uh, here in uh, Belgium. Now, yeah, the question is, what are the alternatives? If you can no longer use um, the privacy shield for transfers to the US, and you can no longer, uh, or it's difficult to use uh, the standard contractual clauses, or you come to the conclusion that standard contractual clauses will nonetheless not provide you with any additional, um, with, with sufficient protection. What are the alternatives? Well, of course, relocating services to the EU is one possibility. It's same, the question arises also then for Brexit and what about data which are located in the UK after um, the transition period for Brexit? Um, you can think about transferring to countries that enjoy a, an adequacy decision, that's a second possibility. Third possibility, binding corporate rules, and I think indeed that binding corporate rules may um, become more popular uh, after this Schrems II decision, because if you see, the privacy shield has been um, invalidated, standard contractual clauses, you need to have a really uh, positive outcome of your transfer impact assessment. Uh, what is left uh, is binding corporate rules, ad hoc clauses which must be um, uh, approved by the European Data Protection Board, and so on. And then the last possibility is invoke derogations. You know that there is a list of derogations where you can uh, transfer data to non-EEA countries that are not offering adequate protection. But again, according to EPDP uh, guidance, those derogations must be uh, interpreted strictly. And for example, consent cannot be an option for regular and systematic transfers. So basically, the options are limited. Now, what do you have to do as a controller or a processor in the next uh, days and months? Um, I've tried to summarize it uh, in a couple of points. And I think the first point is, of course, uh, you will need to monitor the reactions of the different supervisory authorities of the EDPS and of the EDP, because this will be crucial. For example, the question, will they grant a grace period, yes or no? Will they provide more um, clarity on what you can do if you come to the conclusion that SECs alone are not sufficient? Will they come with a new set of standard contractual clauses? Whatever the first thing is to do, the first thing to do is monitor the reactions of the relevant um, authorities. Secondly, of course, follow the developments um, within the European Commission in the field of data protection, for example, adopting standard contractual clauses or a new version of the standard contractual clauses is, um, um, is, 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 is a competence of the European Commission, so you need to follow up that also. I think thirdly, um, within your organization, you will need to uh, map the current international transfers and you will need to uh, verify which of my transfers are based on privacy shield, which are of my transfers are based on standard contractual clauses. Uh, you will need to review foreign law when the transfer has been done on the basis of standard contractual clauses. 
and consider possible alternatives where transfers are only based on privacy shield you will effectively need to look for another solution um, i've also put on the slide perform regular audits because indeed this is uh, and this is has also been stressed by the court of justice that um, legislation and the legal framework governing personal data in a foreign country or in any country is something that evolves and it may evolve for for example due to uh, specific um, guidance that has been issued by the um, by the by the data protection authorities so you will need uh, even when you have come to the conclusion that secs can be used and you have put in place those secs you will need, need to revisit that decision from time to time and see what hasn't anything changed in those countries and are those standard contractual clauses still um, sufficient protection for uh, the privacy of individuals. And then the, the most important um, issue is of course what everyone is today calling transfer impact assessments. Uh, you know that the, um, uh, the GDPR already talks about data protection impact assessments that you need to do in some cases of high risk. Um, you also know that for assessing your legitimate interests and reliance upon re legitimate interests, you may need to do or undertake legitimate interest assessments. Um, now we have a third type of um, impact assessment, the so-called transfer impact assessment. That means that whenever you are using or you are intending to use standard contractual clauses, that you um, must do an analysis um, whether those standard contractual clauses will effectively um, provide adequate protection to uh, individuals. And the question is, of course, and hopefully we will get more guidance on this in the next days. Um, and I know that uh, the organization behind Max Schrems, uh, none of your business, has already pointed towards some papers by the, um, by the WP29 um, on how to do those transfer impact assessments. What will be the items that you will need to take into account? Let's be very concrete. Let's look at the decision of the European uh, Court of Justice. Well, first of all, you will need to take into account the type of data. Is it, for example, sensitive data? Is it financial data? Or is it just a name and an address? Um, is it something that is wholly or partly uh, already in the public domain? So the sensitivity of the data, the type of personal data that you want to transfer, you will need to take it into account. You will also need to take into account the original of the personal data because it can be that you want to export data which basically come already from, for example, the third country to which you want to export those data back. In that case, you may say, well, those data weren't so much protected in, for example, the US, we are now going to re-export them to the US. So what is the issue? Uh, that, that are things to take into account. Secondly, you will need to take into account national security laws of third countries. And that's where, and I already said it um, a couple of times, that's where it gets very tricky. Because a lot of those national security laws, and I don't think it's, 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 it's a lot better um, or much better in, in Belgium, they are very opaque. Um, some of those national security laws are even secret laws uh, where you don't have read, read, readily access to. So it's, it's a very delicate and very difficult exercise to do, especially for um, controllers and processors um, that need to do that for a multitude of transfers. And it's again uh, taking into account the legislation of the particular third country to which you want to export data. You will need to look at national judicial remedies. So have data subjects really rights, uh, enforceable rights and, and, and remedies in those third countries? 
You will also need to look at technical safeguards, and this is an item that has been flagged already a couple of times, but if you are intending, for example, to transfer data to the US under standard contractual clauses, but those data will, from the transfer, be encrypted or tokenized, uh, you may have an argument to say, well, the chances that uh, US intelligence services will have access to my data are rather slim. So technical safeguards are certainly one of the elements to take into account in your transfer impact assessment. Another element to take into account, and I haven't mentioned it here, but I think that it will also be important to know to what sector are you going to transfer those data and to what kind of company. Uh, we received some questions on this already, but for example, and I said it already, um, US surveillance laws, they are directed mainly towards internet, internet service providers and telecom companies or electronic communication service providers. Suppose you want to appoint an accountancy firm in the US, an accounting uh, a big four in the US. Suppose that uh, this is the case and you want to do that on the basis of standard contractual clauses, one could come to the conclusion that your data are much less likely to be subject to US surveillance, unless, of course, and that's where the issue gets complicated, unless, of course, your uh, accounting firm in the US is using cloud services such as Google, Amazon, uh, and so on, which are subject to US surveillance uh, laws. So I think sector and company and type of activity that is being outsourced or where data is being transferred is also important. And last element is you will need to update this on a regular basis. So this is not a one-time assessment that you do before putting in place the standard contractual clauses. And I hope there will be more guidance, but there, this is probably something that you will need to revisit on a regular basis, just like you need to revisit um, data protection impact assessments on a regular basis to see whether the conclusions that you once drawn um, are still uh, valid. And this brings me to the end of um, this uh, webinar, or at least the, the part of the presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, just taking the time. Yes, one of the questions, and I think that that will uh, that will need uh, further investigations, is um, some of the um, uh, data protection authorities, such as the Berlin Data Protection Authority, has said, well, uh, if you are Trans, if you have transferred data to the US, you need to recall those data and you need to ask those data to be held in Europe. And the, the question is, of course, whether this helps if you are working with a US um, cloud services provider, because one could well imagine that um, US surveillance laws and US law enforcement uh, laws um, provide that as from the moment that uh, you are a US uh, company, even where the data is located outside of the US, you must grant access to um, US law enforcement authorities. So this is why the, the, the whole exercise is becoming so difficult, is that you will need to really go into the detail, because first of all, surveillance laws may apply um, also outside of the borders of the third country and for example from the moment that you are using a third country or, or a service provider that is based in that third country um, secondly even where um, you have asked your service provider to um, to hold the data within the European Economic Area or within the European Union, 
It may be that certain functions, such as support, administration, and so on, are exercised uh, from, for example, a country such as China or the US or Russia. And in that case, this may trigger application of uh, surveillance laws and possibly access to your data. The second question that we received, the EDPB has stated in its first in, in the first place that uh, it is the responsibility of the data export to exporter to analyze compliance. Can a data exporter then afford to wait for a, um, a supervisory authority decision? Um, well, I think that when we are in the early days after the Trans 2 decision, even the supervisory authorities are still examining this decision. Um, I think as a um, as a prudent um, controller that is exporting data to countries such as the US, you will need to start your analysis immediately, but at the same time um, look at the um, at the evolutions and the developments that are taking place at the various uh, supervisory authorities, and hopefully there will be some kind of grace period or some kind of leniency granted so that as a controller or as a processor um, you have sufficient time to carry out your analysis of the different data streams and your analysis of the or, or do your different transfer impact uh, assessments yeah and then a question the third question that we received, the data exporter has to make a case-by-case -case analysis uh, for the standard contractual clauses. When the Court of Justice comes to the conclusion that protection in the U.S. is not comparable to the GDPR, how can a data exporter uh, come to a different conclusion for the U.S.? Uh, I think that's a very, very uh, true and, and very, very good question. Um, I think that will indeed be uh, very... Uh, that would be very difficult but i do not exclude it because the um, um, what what the, uh, what the court of justice has said is that it would need to be a case by case analysis and as i said uh, if you take into account the type of data and for example also the sector and i think that will be a very important element uh, to what extent is your data importer in the US, in China, and so on, is that data importer directly subject to some of those um, surveillance laws and so on? Of course, this is only one aspect. The other aspect is enforceable rights, um, enforcement or remedies before the courts and tribunals. Uh, but I think it may depend on type of data or type of transfer type of activity that you and type of processing that you want to have done in the US and what is the identity of your um, counterpart in the uh, third country, what sector is he or she in and so on. But I agree indeed that it will be very difficult to come to another uh, conclusion for the US and that's also and, and that's it's maybe and that's maybe to, to finalize um, what will happen with the privacy shield? Because it's clear that the privacy shield is no longer valid. Um, after the safe harbor was struck down, um, the European Commission immediately started working on an alternative. And the big question is today is, uh, will they do the same? And will they try to find an agreement with the US on a privacy shield this or a privacy I don't know what, uh, or will they just come to the conclusion that, look, without any fundamental change of the laws and the legal system in the US around data protection, um, it, is, it will never be possible to enter into, uh, or it will never be possible to uh, set up a system that offers adequate protection uh, or appropriate safeguards uh, for the US. Um, I think uh, let's wait and see. My own um, my own personal opinion is that it will be the latter, uh, meaning that I think that we probably need to come to the conclusion that 
without fundamental legal changes in the system, in the legal system in the US, um, it will be very, very difficult to put in place something um, like a privacy shield bis, uh, because, well, in the end, there are only so much things you can um, you can uh, regulate through uh, a system of voluntarily uh, adherence, uh, such as privacy shield, um, and a lot of the things that are bothering the European Court of Justice uh, today are things that are just laid down by US laws and in particular US uh, surveillance laws. And I would like to hereby um, close this uh, webinar. I hope this is, has given you um, the most important um, messages from the Schrems 2 decision. Of course, we at Lydian, we um, continue to monitor the situation um, together with you, we will continue to bring out news articles on um, this decision and on the consequences of this decision. And of course, feel free to contact us in case you have specific questions uh, for us or you want us to look at some of your uh, data transfers. Thank you very much for attending today and uh, have a very nice afternoon.